The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 6. The elders have asked me to preach on the office of deacon this morning to the church to really help us understand their high calling and how uh, they're to function in the church, how the church is to function with them, and how uh, they, they correlate in the ministry with the elders as well, and this, whole, this holistic ministry that God has designed in the body of Christ. God has lit my heart up with the beauty of deacons and the way they function in the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My eyes have been opened to see God's mercy and his large heart to the church by giving us deacons. I spent a lot of time over the years preaching about elders. So this day is to lead this church in our hearts to understand deacons and why they're just so important to the church and how we're going to utilize them. So Acts chapter 6, turn with me. <clears throat> this chapter is where we see the first deacons that were brought into the church. And they were appointed to this office here really in embryo form. And this role will take shape and it matured in the early church. So by the time that Paul would later write to Timothy, he's going to lay out the qualities and the characteristics of a deacon that will be necessary if they're going to function well in this role. And just out of the gate, I just want to read those qualities to you before we look at Acts 6. So 1 Timothy 3.8 says this, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let these also first be tested. And then let them serve as deacons if they're beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate and faithful in all things. Let deacons be husbands of only one wife, good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. What an honor for those men. And so these men are to be godly men who will love and serve the body of Christ. And they won't abuse their authority over the church as they humbly have led their families. They will lead us in the same kindness and gentleness and truthful way. They don't have characteristics then that will hurt the body of Christ, that will bring division instead of the unity of the body, for us being built up and not torn down. They must be special men. They must have dignity, that, that there's a, a respect to them. They're not double-tongued, yes, yes, and no, no, and cause all these problems. They're not addicted to wine or, or sordid gain to try to use it to gain an advantage financially or monetarily or, or just status. They, they're the husband of one wife. They're safe in dealing with the opposite sex to not use their authority or manipulation. And so you can see that this office is a high calling from God with high character and spirit-led men to accomplish what they're tasked to do for the body of Christ. And so now let's go to Acts. Acts 6. Brian already began talking about it at the baptisms, but the, the context is absolutely beautiful. The ascension of Jesus Christ is where this book begins. He has come and he has done the work of redemption, everything necessary to bring you back safely into the presence of God. He's been resurrected and now he has ascended to the right hand, seated in absolute victory. The promise of his Holy Spirit then has been given that when he comes, us believers will receive power, power from on high to be witnesses of Christ to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. We've been empowered by the Spirit of God to take this message into the world. Pentecost then comes. The Spirit is poured out on the church, and they begin preaching in power and in wisdom of the mystery of Jesus Christ that has been hidden for past ages and now is being made known to the world. And Luke just starts recording then the ingathering of the nations. Uh, just look at Acts 2.41. I just want you to read a couple verses to get a picture of what Luke is capturing. 
So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Jump down to verse 47 of chapter 2. They're praising God and they're having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And Luke just keeps recording again and again so we don't miss the power of the gospels going out and people are believing and coming in by the droves. And so now the enemy gets active. Persecution begins happening in the early book of Acts. They're being arrested, and they're being flogged, and they're being threatened. You stop preaching Jesus, or you will be killed. And, it, and they just keep preaching them. Are we to obey God or man? We're going to keep preaching the name of Jesus Christ. And it's resulting in more and more people believing in Jesus because they're suffering so well. They're singing hymns in prison, and you can't shut them up. And so the, the beauty of watching them suffer for the name of Jesus Christ is causing the advance of the gospel. And so now the devil, it is not working. He starts trying pollution and hypocrisy where they're selling and their, their, their goods, their houses, and bringing the money. And Ananias and Sapphira come in and they lie and they deceive and try to make themselves look better than they are. Now in our context, he's trying another means, another scheme of the devil. He's trying to bring disunity one of his favorite devices into the body of Christ. If I can bring disunity, I can break down the power of the gospel and what God is doing. If I can't get them to quit preaching this message, I can, I can get them to break their oneness and destroy their testimony that is shining so bright in this world. It's too bright. Too many are coming into the kingdom and the preaching of this word. Let, let's dim it. Let's put it out. And these early Christians, they, they love like no one has ever loved in the history of this world. And he says, you've heard you know, that you should hate your enemies and love others. I'm saying love your enemies. They're, they're loving their enemies. They're loving one another. It's beautiful. They're united and they're unified. And there's such diversity in Acts 2. They're from all these different nations and uh, tongues and languages. And they've all come together now. And there's this unity that the world cannot bring in the body of Christ. They're loving widows and orphans, the most needy and vulnerable people in society. And they, don't, they not only love their own, they love the world's and theirs. And they're just marveling at the love that's breaking out in the church. And the love of this bunch and their unity is spreading like wildfire. And it's causing more and more people to believe the message of Jesus Christ because it's so lovely what's being worked out and the saints of God. Look at Acts 2.42. I just want you to get a little picture of the beauty of what is going on in this church. In verse 42, they, the church, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone just kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles, their healing and raising dead people. And all those who had believed were together, and they had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need in this body. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Do you see the bright light of this early church and what broke out on the day of Pentecost? Well, this morning, we're going to now take up the enemy's attempt to sow strife and to break down the power of what is going on in this Jerusalem church. It is advancing at a rate that is faster than any uh, movement or any truth has ever spread in the history of the world. It's breaking out, and the enemy has to shut it down. Turn with me to Acts chapter 6. And I need to get moving. Now at this time, 
while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation. That never happens. That the whole congregation is like, yes. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles. And after praying, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase. So this morning, here's your outline of this passage. We're going to have Luke recording four important aspects of these first deacons that were appointed to the church of God. And the first, what we're going to notice in verse 1 is there's a very difficult context here. And then in verse 2, there's a, a difficult dilemma with the apostles and then in verses 3 through 6, we're going to see the spirit-filled solution to the problem called deacons. And then in verse 7, I want to show you the supernatural outcome of what came as a result of this spirit-filled decision. So look with me first at the difficult context, verse 1. <clears throat> now, at this time, what time? Well, everything that I just laid out. The power of God and the kingdom advancing and they're coming in by the droves and they're unified and there's a oneness at that time and the, the beauty of revival, all this gorgeous things that God is doing at that time, what happened while the disciples were advancing in number, they're coming in, Christianity's breaking out into the world in an unprecedented way at that time. At that time, the enemy is now sowing strife and trouble. He's bringing it even in revival. People think revival, there's no sin. When God's working, there's still going to, that's when the enemy comes the most. And he begins sowing strife and discord and all of these things to break down the focus of gospel and our gospel unity. So many expect uh, when God is moving, everyone's just doing Acts 2.42, and there's no problems. But the devil starts sowing persecution, hypocrisy, and here this morning it says a complaint arose. Uh, the Greek word, they're, they're grumbling, and it's gongusamos. Isn't that a great word? It just sounds like grumbling, gongusamos. It's like murmur. They're murmuring. There, there's just nothing new under the sun. They, they begin grumbling about, here's God changing the world and the gospel's breaking out and they're grumbling. Amazing. What was the complaint? What, what could you complain about in the midst of such beauty and awe with miracles and converts? On verse one, it says, what broke out was on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Uh-oh. This new church was birthed at Pentecost, and it had come again from all kinds of nations and cultures, and they now have an ethnic issue in the body of Christ. This great unity and oneness is now in jeopardy. Our love's in jeopardy. It's coming. And you have the Hellenistic Jews, and they were Jewish, and they came from the dispersion, which had been heavily influenced by the Greek culture. And so they actually spoke Greek. And they even had their own synagogue. They, they had their separate synagogues from the other group here, the native Hebrews, who spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, and they very much saw themselves as superiors in many ways to the Hellenistic Jews. Paul said, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I came from this group. And so now there's a division between these two groups that before salvation, there was a big division between these two groups, and, and so much that they had different places where they had to worship. But now the Spirit of God is poured out, and the gospel comes, and they're saved, and they are dwelling together in unity and oneness in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just beauty is coming out of it. God did what no power or slogan or government could ever do, 
and bringing the oneness, breaking down walls, and bringing us together this morning from every tribe, tongue, and nation into a oneness and a unity that this world, America, cannot get this. They're trying, they're fighting, it's breaking down, and when we come into these walls, this is what God does. There's a unity and there's a oneness, but now in the middle of that, the enemy's sowing a problem here between the Hellenistic Jews and the native Hebrews. He, they begin to start escalating now their disunity and to get their eyes on their differences in the flesh. Let's quit looking at our oneness and our unity in Christ and let's start noticing all of our differences. Let's start seeing we have different skin color, different socioeconomics. Let's start looking at all of these differences and get focused on those things. That's where the enemy comes. Get your eyes off the oneness that we have in the spirit. They're having problems right now. And how was it being manifested? On verse 1, their widows, the Hellenistic Jews, were being overlooked in the daily serving of the food. <clears throat> in Acts 4, 34 through 35, they were all selling and laying their goods at the feet of the apostles, and they were distributing them to anyone that might have need. I love this. <laughs> I see this here daily. I've watched people who this morning would be on the streets if it wasn't for you, loving, sacrificing, and giving. It, it goes on on a daily basis. It's unbelievable and beautiful, and that's what was going on in this early church. And now the beauty of this has broken down in a certain area. And the widows, the Hellenistic Jews, somehow are being overlooked as they distributed food to these widows who were so vulnerable and in need. And Luke does not record for us uh, how or why this was happening. I, I know some of you like a lot of details. I don't have them. I don't, I don't know exactly what they were doing. It might have been a communication issue. They spoke Greek. You speak Hebrew. It could have been favoritism or it could have been flat out bigotry and sin that was going on in this group. I don't know for sure, but we do know this. It has caused the Hellenistic Jews to grumble about this treatment of their widows. And it has grown and it has spread through the church because it's made its way down to the apostles who we call elders. And also it will be addressed publicly to the whole church how they're going to fix the problem. They're, the apostles are going to call the whole church together. It tells me this is probably permeated through the whole group. And so we have a real problem that is threatening the power and the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. It's going on right now. So to summarize the problem here in verse 1 then that's come into this early church, I would say this. They have a practical problem. Widows are not getting their necessary daily food and they're dependent on it. There's a unity problem because one group is now complaining against another group. And there's a sin problem. They're murmuring and they're grumbling about it and they're spreading strife. And the biggest one is there's a gospel witness problem because we're one new people. And I'm telling you, race and all these differences can't break it down. And if it does, we've lost the gospel. And so that's the, the issue at stake here is what do we do with, with our oneness and the way we've been spreading the gospel because we're so unified from all walks of life and we're doing what the world can never do in Jesus Christ. And it's beautiful and it's lovely. And that's now being threatened in this early church. Second point. That's our first one. It's a difficult context. Now in verse 2, it's going to pose a difficult dilemma for the apostles if you'll look with me in verse 2. <clears throat> so the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. So our second point is this dilemma for the apostles. We have a real problem. Let, let, let's, uh, let one of the apostles fix this problem. Let them oversee the distribution of the daily food and make sure that every widow is treated fairly and lovingly. The apostles can fix this. You've been distributing the food. It's getting too big for you, but you need to take it over and fix it. Uh, this would have been an easy fix for an apostle. He could have done this. And much to my own nearsightedness and lack of wisdom, I have run and sought to fix threat of disunity and issues like this in my own strength. I will fix this. It's wrong what the person over caring for the widows is doing, right? It makes me angry that you're, you're skipping the Hellenistic widows. And I just want to jump in, don't you? 
<laughs> How many of you, just go fix that. It's wrong. You can't be doing that to widows. What's wrong with you? I'm going to fire whoever's over this and start doing it. I love both groups, and I, I care that all are treated in love and protected. I got this. But that poses a real dilemma for the apostles, because their calling in this passage is to preach the Word of God in season and out of season. Your calling is to get in this Word, study it, know it, sow it everywhere you can. That's your calling, elder. And to pray for the people, to plead for your people before the throne of God and pray that the Word of God will break into your hearts and do what God wants it to do even this morning. And so the people have been devoted in Acts 2.42 to their teaching. They were giving themselves to the teaching. And I think that's why this gospel is breaking out and spreading because they gave themselves to the word of God. They're coming and hearing it taught. They're, they're exploding and salvation and disciples are coming out. Yet if this problem with the Hellenistic widows is not resolved rightly, our witness and testimony to this world is going to be hurt greatly. And so we can't just ignore it, right? It's, there's, there's got, it's got to be taken care of. Or you can preach till the cows come home, and if everybody's not loving widows in your church and mistreating each other, you've killed the gospel. You can teach forever. But if there's not love flowing out of a church because of truth, then you've you got no witness. And that's what's going on here. And so this is a big deal. So I want you to listen to what the apostles say. Again, in verse 2, they summoned the congregation of the disciples and they said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Does that feel defensive to you? When I read it, it just at first blushed. It almost felt defensive. We can't do both of these things. Someone, what, why? Why? Because why? someone's probably saying, yeah, you guys can keep teaching the word and telling us what to do, but do you know that Jesus cared for widows? He got down in their midst and he healed them and he fed them and he loved them and, and he washed disciples' feet. Maybe it's time you get down from your ivory pulpits and come serve and love those widows, apostles. That's my interpretation. Could be right. Guys, this is the pressure that every elder faces if you care about your task. I want to meet needs I love this flock with a passion, and when you guys heard, I heard, I was just sitting in Sunday school looking at every different person praying to God for what they were going through and that God would meet them and help them, and it's your, your burdens have become my burdens, and I'll run after every one of them, but I'm dying. <laughs> I learned on vacation, you're overdoing it. You're going to die if you keep doing this, because I'm trying to be a servant to the Word and a servant to every practical need that I come across. And there's the, the pressure of a growing church and the growing administration of it. This is a living organism. It's people who've been born again, we're alive, and it's, it's organic. And yet it's also an organization that has to have structure. So it's a trellis that has a vine that grows organically, and every church has to have both. And there's a great threat here to the church of God. By the apostles leaving the ministry of the word to spend their time ministering the food to the widows. And so guys, there, there are several ways that they could have responded, the apostles. And all of these, I think, have been done throughout church history. The first one is, don't you guys know that we are a preaching center? We give you the word. We're not the Denver Rescue Mission. We're not going to solve every social injustice issue. All we're about is the word, the word, the word. It's wrong. Secondly, let's start a committee to fix this and study this out. And when you make a committee to a committee to solve it, and 15 years later, there's no solution, that is not going to work. We could just say, hey, grumbling's a sin. Stop grumbling. You know what they did with Moses? And when they did, they opened up the ground and swallowed the Korah and the whole group. Okay, so quit grumbling because you never know if the earth will open up and swallow you. <laughs> the other one is God loves widows. And we need to give ourselves to make sure that it's done right at any cost because this is so near and dear to God's heart. Elders, get out there and do everything you can then to love these widows. A fifth one could be, I urge Udio and Sintike to live in harmony. Just quit fighting Hellenistic Jews and regular Hebrew of Hebrews. Stop. Live in harmony. 
There's so many ways that you could try to solve this problem, but all they will do is create more problems, and they'll, they'll create new ones. So my third point is I want to look at a spirit-filled uh, way to fix this problem. Verses 3 through 6. It's a difficult context. There's a difficult dilemma. We've got we to we give ourselves to the Word of God. And then here's the spirit-filled solution, and it starts with my favorite word, therefore. Therefore, what's it there for? Okay, therefore, uh, verse 3, let's select from among you seven good men, and it's going to list what they are. But here's our Greek word, diakonos. Diakonos is is the solution, and it's an interesting word. It, It can mean just a servant, a minister, or even the office of deacon. <clears throat> Sorry. This word can just simply mean service in general. It's a beautiful word. It can mean to care for physical needs. It says the angels do it. Peter said they're, they're deacons. They're serving God as deacons. So the root word is a table waiter, and it can also, again, mean the office of the diaconate. But most uses of this word are just the common one. Jesus said the, the greatest among you will be your deacon. will be the one who come and serve you and come under. Jesus called himself a deacon. Paul said he was a deacon to the Gentiles. I'm a servant to the Gentiles. In verse 4, Luke uses the, the same word that the apostles said, we will be deacons of the word. So there's deacons who are going to serve, and then there's elders who, they're actually deacons to the word of God. You're servants to the word of God to give yourself to it, to teach and preach. It. Servants of the word. Uh, The apostles' solution then is just so beautiful. Here's our solution. Deacons. Deacons. God's given spiritual gifts to the church for the building up of itself into the head, but he's also given to his bride deacons. Here you go. Deacons. God's wisdom. God's plan to serve the body and to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We need deacons. And so get this. It's so important then if this role is such a high role, the deacons need to be, he says, of good reputation in verse 3. You've got to have a good reputation, which means your character, there's quality to you. And you need to be full of the Spirit, which produces love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and self-control, faithfulness as you enter into this body. You're led by the Spirit of God, and you're going to do this, and you're going to be like the way Jesus was with the fruit of the Spirit as you serve the body of Christ. And he says you'll have wisdom. You need to have wisdom to know how to deal with some of these issues that come up like what we're looking at in this chapter. You need wisdom to solve and fix things in the body. Why? Because you are the unifiers in this body. Not the ones complaining about the church all the time. Not the grumblers. You're to solve the grumbling. You don't spread strife and conflict. Like what Mark Dever said, he says, you are like shock absorbers. I'm going to be honest, I've never looked inside a tire in my life, so I don't even know what one looks like, but I know what happens if you don't have them. Every bump goes like this. (laughs) And so every little bump in the church, it just goes like this. And deacons come and they're shock absorbers to take the conflicts and the issues, and as they come, they, their, their, their abilities and their gifts and their wisdom and their spirit-filled leadership keeps the unity of the Spirit and the body of Christ. They're uniters and not dividers. They can't be men who, who are about their own rights or their sphere or their control. They're humble servant leaders who use their gifts and abilities to build up the church of God and to bind us together with kindness and service. And as a result, they support the elders so that the elders can devote themselves to the Word of God and prayer that is necessary for the Word of God going forth and the gospel and us being built up into the head. We're deacons of the Word, elders, and these deacons allow for us to be about that business. And so one faithful man of God put it this way, He said, deacons coordinate the needed ministries to the church, unifying the body by using human resources of the body of Christ. And so you seek them out to say, here's where I want to serve. 
Here's where I'm gifted. And I, I want to help the body of Christ. And, and so they need you. They need you. They're not called to do it all. They're these ones who lead in it. And so they need uh, your skills and your gifts volunteered to them to use the body and their gifting. I was just thinking through this. It's an example of communion, but I'm out of time. So it would have been a great example of how this whole body works together with the way Jason oversees uh, communion. So it comes to me later. I'll share it with you. I just want you to notice the beauty of the design of the church then. The apostles, listen to this, they call the whole church together. And they say to the church, you pick seven men with these qualities because they're in your midst and you know them and you've watched them and you've seen the fruit. That's why we take nominations from you guys. Who do you see like this? So they're all working together. The church is picking them. And the congregation picks the men. And you want to know what's interesting about who they picked? All seven names are Greek. <laughs> That's wisdom. We're having a problem with the Greek Jews with the other Jews. Let's get seven people who are Greek to make sure the Greek widows get taken care of. Boom, good choice. And then the elders pray over them, which appoints them now to this office and task. They have the authority from God to do this task in your midst. That is the unity, and it's a holistic team working for the same goal, the glory of God. And so the deacons carry the authority of God to fulfill their roles. So my call this morning is you respect them, and you honor them, and you help them, and you pray for them. I want you to make their task a joy and not a burden. Don't resist them and don't do the famous elder runaround. I'm going to go past them and go tattle to the elders. Stop. Stop. They're spirit-filled men, work with them. Help them. Join them with your gifts and work together for the glory of Christ and his gospel. Amen? Isn't that beautiful? I love how God designs his bride. So deacons, shock absorbers, not wave runners. You know what wave runners do? The beautiful, peaceful church and you get in that lake and all of a sudden you just make waves go everywhere. Shock absorbers. Don't be wave runners. All right, that's for free. So we need more deacons in both uses of the word. We, we need uh, elders who will be deacons to this word, and we need deacons who will be deacons to this body and service. An office where you will love and care for the needs of this body, and will do it in a way that the unity of the Spirit will be preserved. And so you serve as one then who's full of the Holy Spirit of God in this body. The last point. And this is why I'm glad I didn't preach on faith and I got to preach on deacons. You might be saying, that isn't that exciting. Listen to this fourth point. <laughs> difficult context, difficult dilemma, spirit-filled solution. And our last point, the supernatural outcome. Look in verse seven. As a result, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So as a result, the word of God just kept on spreading. The apostles, the elders, they devoted themselves to the word of God and to prayer. So they kept preaching the word. So they're having communion with God, studying, growing, sowing it all over. And the fruit of this is disciples now who are taking hold of the gospel and following after Jesus Christ. In verse 1, it says that the, of Acts 6, they were increasing in number. This problem arises. It's dealt with in wisdom and love. Solution is deacons. The widows that are a minority in this new church, they're loved and they're cared for by these deacons. And what happens? The power of the gospel goes forth even more. Even more. What the enemy tried to destroy the church with ended up empowering it even more. I don't mind when the devil sows things then. If we deal with them God's way, it spreads even further because it should have destroyed and broke us up. But there's unity. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly. And I love that. A great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Luke is making it clear by the way they dealt with this, it bore great fruit for the kingdom of God. Love and truth go forth in great victory. And God uses this to advance his kingdom. 
the word of God being proclaimed and taught and counseled in season and out of season, with deacons overseeing the physical and the mercy needs of the body, and men who exude the gospel who are filled with the Spirit, and the world looks on and they can make no claim against us. Our apologetic is that all men will know that we're his disciples because we have love for one another. It'll make them want your Christ when they see this. And I just, I could preach on this for an hour. Even the priests are being converted because they're meeting in, in the outer courts and they're watching what's going on and they're seeing this and, and all, all that they've been doing and seeing and why do we have to sew that veil back in two after it was torn when Jesus died and now they're seeing the power of the gospel and everyone's acting like a priest in this new covenant and they're coming to faith by the droves. They were seeing the gospel by our love and words. We were devoted to it and the gospel is just irresistible to the world. Doesn't that do something for you? I love deacons and I love their gift to the church, but they need your prayers and your help to function in this beautiful way. So let's pray in one heart and in one spirit for the, the, our unity and for our deacons, and then we'll sing a song and we're gonna call up uh, our deacon and elder and their families. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this glorious design. I thank you that the enemy wanted to destroy this bright light and, and what he sowed, you used it for good as you've always promised. You brought more glory than even before he tried it. Thank you, God. He's a junkyard dog tethered to your will. Uh, we rejoice uh, in this. And I pray now for our deacons, God, I pray that you pour out abundant grace on them to be these godly shock absorbers, leading and guiding and directing these things so that the elders can be ministers to the word of God and that the whole church will be working in unity and we will care about the message and we'll care about the sheep in this flock, that we will love them and, and meet their needs and help them in their journey to glory. God, unite us as one to help everyone in this room make it to the very end to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Let nobody sit on the sidelines and let nobody be uncaring toward brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray that you would do a mighty work so that the world would look on and all men would know we're your disciples because we have this love. God, advance your kingdom through the beauty and glory of this, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.